For the first couple months of this season, it looked like Keegan Aiken had really found himself as a major league pitcher. And then it all came crashing down in the second half. We'll try to figure out what the heck happened with Keegan Aiken's season, plus dive into Mike Bauman's short year in the majors as well. All coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, November 30th, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to continue our Orioles 2022 player season review series. We've actually, including this one, only got three more of these episodes to go. We still have to talk about Anthony Santander and Dean Kramer and their seasons coming up over the next week or two. But today we are going to talk about the last couple of kind of relief slash starting pitchers we're going to get to. And that's Keegan Aiken and Mike Bauman. We're going to talk about Aiken's incredible first couple months of the season. Now he was a dynamite two to three inning kind of fireman reliever for the Orioles. And then talk about what happened in July and later that made his ERA skyrocket and caused him to be optioned to triple A before the end of the season. Then we'll take a look at Mike Bauman, who made the opening day roster and then was in triple A for like three months, but then came back at the end. And we'll sort it all out and talk about each of their futures with the Orioles heading into 2023 and beyond. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. Before we get there, just want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms. And of course, right here on the Locked On Orioles YouTube channel. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And specifically, we're doing a giveaway this week only right here on the Locked On Orioles YouTube channel. So if you're just listening on audio, head over to YouTube, subscribe to Locked On Orioles right here, and you can be entered to win the beautiful Eddie Murray print that we talked about on yesterday's episode. So if you haven't listened to Tuesday's episode, go back and listen to that one first. Daniel Horine, the artist behind the Pop Fly Pop Shop, joined us to talk about the Eddie Murray print he did with Eddie, basically like he's a superhero on the front of a comic book. And you can win a free one of these prints. All you have to do is subscribe to the Locked On Orioles podcast on YouTube and leave a comment on any of our episodes this week including today, including yesterday when we talked about it, about either your favorite Eddie Murray memory or your favorite Eddie Murray stat or fact about his time with the Baltimore Orioles. You'll be automatically entered to win. Now, make sure to keep checking that comment because I will pick a winner on Friday. So make sure to get those comments in. And once I do Friday, I will respond to your comment on YouTube telling you that you've been the winner and giving you further instructions to get that print. So again, Comment on the videos, your favorite Eddie Murray memory to be entered. And we thank you so much for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. For your first listen today, let's jump right into it. Orioles 2022 season player review series. Wrapping up, only a couple more of these to do. But today, talking about two guys who I think at one point were slated to be big contributors in the Orioles starting rotation for years to come. And both guys who now I think just have a bullpen ce ceiling for the O's. And that's Keegan Aiken and Mike Bauman. And let's start with Keegan Aiken because he had much more major league time than Bauman did this year and just had a much more interesting major league season. So coming into the year for Aiken, who is now 27 years old and he will be 28 right around opening day of next year, the left-hander who is a free agent after 2026. I mean, he's still around for four more years and is not arbitration eligible until next off season. So he'll still be making the minimum in 2023. And a, and a guy I think the O's want to hold on to. He came into the season in an interesting spot because the Orioles had called him up late in the shortened season in 2020. And he had pitched about 26 innings and, you know, it was a four, five, six ERA, but you know, the FIP was much better. He was striking out 12.3 batters per nine. The stuff looked really good. And it was really promising for Aiken heading into 2021. I think a lot of those episodes I did in the off season between 20 and 21, I basically slotted Keegan Aiken in no question about it into the opening day rotation for the Orioles. And I think most people agreed with it. He was one of the O's top pitching prospects. He came up and looked good in his first couple of chances. 
The O's didn't have a lot of other great options for their 2021 rotation. And so he seemed like a shoe in and he did get that role, but things did not go well in 2021 for Keegan Aiken. He ended up making 17 starts and then also seven appearances out of the bullpen. And in 95 innings with the O's in 2021, he had a 6.63 ERA. His strikeouts dropped to just 7.8 Ks per nine while his walks went up. The stuff just did not look good. I mean, the fastball velo was the same. He was throwing the same pitches, but he was just getting knocked around bad in 2021. And, you know, we spent a good amount of time in AAA as well. And we were just kind of wondering, is he going to have a role? And, and what will his role be going into 2022? And, and he does make the opening day roster with the Orioles. And the O's kind of showed, well, we don't really see him as a starter anymore. And we've moved into a bullpen role. He made only one start this season with the Orioles. And it was an emergency spot start in that doubleheader September 5th against the Blue Jays when Jordan Lyles got sick and couldn't go. So Keegan Aiken started and, and pitched, I believe, two and two thirds in that game. But otherwise, he was a reliever. And they put him in the bullpen. And things started off, I mean, incredibly well for Keegan Aiken. In his first 19 relief appearances for the Orioles, this went through the end of June, he pitched at least two innings out of the bullpen in each of those first 19 appearances. First pitcher in Orioles history to have their first 19 relief appearances of a season each be at least two innings in length or longer. First Orioles pitcher ever to do it. And it's not like he was just coming in and mop up time and getting slammed. He was pitching well through those first 19 appearances. It was 46 innings. It was a 2.35 ERA with 39 strikeouts to just 12 walks. Opponents were hitting just 160 against him in that span. And he was dominating. And even before that, if you want to go back here on the podcast, about a month into the season on May 4th, it was episode number 507 of the pod. I did a breakdown of Keegan Aiken's first month with the Orioles exclusively out of the bullpen. And, and at that point, he had a one point something ERA. I mean, he was pitching ridiculously well and getting huge, huge outs and pitching two or three innings at a time. And I kind of broke down what was going well. And I talked about how his slider was unhittable. He had changed the shape. He was working that fastball up in the zone like he's done basically entire, his entire time in the O's organization. It's a high spin fastball, good velocity from the left side. His velo was up as well, you know, almost two ticks. I talked about that. And that's really why he pitched so well. But when you dug into the numbers a little further, things got interesting because despite a 2.35 ERA in that stretch of 19 straight two plus inning relief appearances, he had a 3.90 FIP, which isn't terrible. It's about league average. But that means maybe below deck, things weren't as great as they seemed. And when you split Keegan Aiken's season into the first half and the second half, first half being up to the all star break, second half being after, so it's a little more than half of the actual season. But in the first half, he threw 53 in a third innings, had a 2-3-6 ERA. In the second half, he only threw 28 and a third innings because he kind of lost that role as the two-inning guy. Orioles didn't trust him as much. And he had a 4.76 ERA. And there was that one appearance against Boston where he gave up five runs. And because of a, a weird error, none of them were earned. So that ERA could have been much, much higher as well. And you look at it, you say, all right, in that first half, opponents were hitting 178 against him. In the second half, opponents were hitting 310 against him. I mean, you look at all those stats and you say, well, clearly he was way worse in the second half. Something changed, something with the stuff, something with the delivery, the command, whatever, something changed. When you dive into the numbers a little bit deeper, it becomes incredibly hard to kind of sparse out what happened in Keegan Aiken's season. Because you look at the surface numbers, you say, all right, he was good in the first half. He was working two innings at a time. He was giving the O's length. He was throwing an incredible amount of strikes. That was also something I talked about is that his in-zone rate, basically the amount of pitches he was throwing in the general strike zone was way up from 2020 and 21. And he did cut his walk rates big time this year. He threw a lot of strikes. But when you look a little deeper, I mean, how lucky was he getting? Because despite a 2-3-6 ERA in the first half, he did have a 4.14 FIP, which means it's fielding independent pitching, looks at more of the pitcher's true outcome and not just the great defense that Aiken had behind him. Maybe he got a little lucky. He also had a 186 BABIP. That is batting average on balls in play. The major league average is around 280 on BABIP. He was a full 100 points lower than that. That usually shows you usually can't even pitch well enough to have a BABIP that low. In general, uh, that's a lot of luck if you have a bad under 200. 
And that's what happened. So then you look at the second half and you say, all right, all the stats were worse. But you dive deeper and it's a 4.76 ERA in the second half, but it's a 2.55 FIP, which is pretty elite. And then you look, it's a 407 BABIP. Again, league average about 280. Anything over, you know, 320, 330 is considered you're getting really unlucky as a pitcher. Opponents were hitting 407 on balls they put in play against Aiken in the second half. So then things just get even more confusing. And then you look at the stuff in general. In that first half where the ERA was good, 22% strikeout rate, 6% walk rate. That's right around league average. 22% strikeout rate is league average. 8% walk rate is league average, so it was a little below. In the second half, despite the ERA and all the other numbers going way up, at least on the surface, 27% strikeout rate, up 5%, and he lowered the walk rate to just 5%. So you look at all that and you say, so wait a minute. How did he simultaneously become one of the luckiest pitchers in baseball in the first half and one of the unluckiest pitchers in the second half? Because if you just go by K and walk rates and you go by the FIP, his stuff was better in the second half, despite him getting slammed in some outings than it was in the first half when he was one of the Orioles' most reliable pitchers, starter or reliever. I mean, the slider was better this year. You know, it, it had a different shape. He changed it a bit. Opponents hit just 196 against that pitch. He continued to use that changeup at a 28% whiff rate. You know, threw it to righties, got them to swing and miss. He basically got rid of his curveball. So he basically became a fastball 94 up in the zone with the slider and the changeup from the left side as a reliever. And you'll usually see that when guys switch from the rotation to the pen. They'll up velocity, which Aiken did from an average of 92 last year to an average of 93.7 this year. And they'll also usually drop a pitch, which he did. He threw five curveballs all year. He basically got rid of that pitch. So what do you make of Keegan Aiken? Because even though maybe he was getting super unlucky late in the year, the O's were still in a playoff race, and they actually optioned him to AAA briefly in late September because things were so bad. Now, they did call him up again because there was injuries and they needed more arms, so he was only down for a couple days, I believe, and then came right back up for that last week and change of the season. But it got bad enough where he was on the team all year and then got optioned late in the year. Same kind of thing that happened to Joey Crable. It was there all year, and the second half was just so bad that they sent him to AAA for a bit. So now you recap the entire season. 45 appearances, one start, 81 and two-thirds innings, a 3.20 ERA with a 3.59 FIP, struck out about eight and a half batters per nine, walked 2.2 batters per nine. Again, his BABIP ended up being about 267, which is just a little lower than league average. He became much more of a ground ball pitcher this year. It was about 35% his first two years, was just shy of 50% ground balls this year, which definitely made him a different pitcher, made him better. But I don't know. I mean, he wasn't getting hit as hard, nearly as hard this year. Overall, just a 37% hard hit rate after 50 and 43% the last two years. Max exit velocity down, average exit velocity way down, launch angle against him, barrel percentage all down against him. And that caused the ERA to go down. But when you look at the BABIP and the underlying numbers in the first and second half, and you say, well, most people would say, oh, we had a way better first half. And yeah, production-wise, he did. But the stuff was actually better in the second half. And he got crazy unlucky. And when you average it all out, again... It comes to a season where he has a 3.20 ERA and a 3.59 FIP, a 0.5 war according to fan graphs in about 82 innings. It just kind of maybe averaged out to him being a slightly above average major league pitcher. But he certainly didn't look like that at times at the end of the year. I mean, it was bad, bad, bad at the end of the year. So the question to end with is, with all this information, it's almost like I don't have a clear take on because... It's one of the weirder seasons you'll ever see what Keegan Aiken did this year. And he did a lot of good for them at the beginning of the year. And he did a lot of bad for the O's at the end of the year. And I'm happy he did finally get vaccinated this year. Remember, he couldn't go on that first trip to Toronto because he was unvaccinated. Then got the vaccine, was able to go to Toronto with the O's down the stretch. 
So that's an issue, at least for now, off the table. But what do you do with Keegan Aiken next year? I mean, I put out kind of a potential pitching staff for the Orioles on Twitter a couple of days ago on the Locked On Orioles Twitter account. And it assumed that the Orioles would add two pitchers, whether it be one via free agency and one via trade or two via free agency, they would add two starters. And when you do that, and then you put together a rotation and a bullpen, I left Keegan Aiken out because I just couldn't find a spot for him. And let's say the Orioles do add two starting pitchers. You put those two in there with Grayson Rodriguez, Kyle Bradish, and Dean Kramer. Then you look at kind of that long swingman converted starter role in the bullpen. Keegan Aiken will be competing with Austin Voth and Tyler Wells and D.L. Hall. All three of them have a much better shot than Keegan Aiken. I mean, you got to lock in Felix Bautista, Dylan Tate, C.L. Perez, and Brian Baker all into the pen. So there's four spots right there. Voth, Wells, Hall, there's three more. Plus, you got Mike Bauman, who we'll talk about in a bit. Maybe there's a free agent reliever. You got guys like Ryan Watson, Noah Denoyer, Drew Rahm, all you know, kind of maybe hankering for one of these spots. I mean, Denoyer and Rahm just got added to the 40-man, so they're certainly in the mix. Aiken's in a tough spot. He's going to be interesting to see this offseason and see in spring training what happens with him. I mean, he's almost certainly still going to be with the Orioles when they get to Sarasota. But it's going to be tough because the question kind of becomes, who is the real Keegan Aiken? Is it good numbers, bad peripherals? Is it bad numbers, good peripherals? Is it somewhere in the middle? I think it's somewhere in the middle. I don't think he's going to be as good as he was early in the year moving forward. I don't think he's going to be as bad as he was late in the year moving forward. Because both of those numbers, the underlying numbers, tell you he's going to meet somewhere in the middle. And I guess the question becomes, is somewhere in the middle good enough to get innings on an Orioles team that is truly vying for the playoffs in 2023? And I would argue no, especially if they're going to bring in some outside help, which I hope they do via starting pitching this offseason. But he's still got a shot. I just think he's a little behind the eight ball, but maybe the Orioles see it differently because with how weird that season was, there's probably numbers we don't even have that the Orioles have in-house to look at Aiken's season. And, you know, I just went 15 minutes on Keegan Aiken. He wasn't not even close to any of like the top 10 or even 15 maybe most important players for this Orioles season. But it was so intriguing and kind of a crazy year. So, hey, maybe he'll have more of a normal year next year, and maybe that'll be better. But... He's going to have to fight for a spot on next year's team. But another guy who's going to have to fight for a spot on next year's team is Mike Bauman, who's kind of in the same role as Keegan Aiken. You know, he was a starter. Maybe he still is, but could fit better out of the bullpen. But you could argue he's even further behind Aiken on that depth chart. So coming up next, we'll look at Bauman's season in the majors and what he has to do to earn a role with the 2023 Orioles. But first... This episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Simply Safe. If you've thought about securing your home with home security but have been putting it off, you want to listen up because right now, Locked On Orioles listeners can order the number one rated Simply Safe home security system for 50% off. This is their biggest offer of the year. You won't want to miss it. And here is why we love it. In an emergency, 24 7 professional monitoring agents use Fast Protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real so you can get priority police response. And Simply Safe, it's whole home security. They got sensors for every room, window, and door, HC security cameras inside and out. There's smarter ways to detect motion that alert you only when the threat is real. And they've even got hazard sensors that detect fires, floods, and other threats into your home. They've got an app as well that makes it so easy to control your system right from your phone. So don't miss your chance to save big on the only security system we recommend. Get 50% off any new Simply Safe system at simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB. This is their biggest discount of the year. So don't wait. That's simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB. There's no safe like Simply Safe. So we just got done trying to figure out Keegan Aiken's wild, wacky roller coaster. 2022 season. Now, a guy who had, in some reasons, less of a roller coaster, in other ways, more of a roller coaster, was Mike Bauman in 2022. I wanted to briefly touch on his season as well. Now, he's only a little bit younger than Keegan Aiken. 
Aiken turns 28 in April. Bauman turns 28 next September. But Bauman does have more team control. He still has one option left to the minors, but we've seen him less just because of injuries. He hasn't gotten as much time in the big leagues with the Orioles. And it was maybe more of a roller coaster season for Bauman than Aiken in the sense that, you know, Aiken was pretty much in the big leagues all year. I mean, he had that one quick little stint in AAA in late September, but got called right back up. Not the case for Mike Bauman, who actually made this opening day roster. And, you know, when I've done this series, this player review series, I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on who was on the team at what time. I mean, I'm covering this team day in and day out, doing five episodes a week for you. I'm talking about all the roster moves. I kind of remember who's with the team. And I knew Mike Bauman was with the team in April. I remember him kind of getting those early relief appearances. But I had to do a double take when I looked and I realized, yeah, he was he was on the opening day roster. Didn't get the earliest of chances, but he did get some chances in April. He got five appearances out of the Oriole bullpen in April, and the O's were bad in April, and quite frankly, Bauman was kind of bad in April. Seven and a third innings in five appearances, five runs, six Ks, but six walks. And they sent him down on April 29th. He spent some time in AAA. They call him up on May 21st. They needed an arm. He actually pitches well, goes three and two thirds in relief, gives up one run, two Ks to no walks, but is basically sent back down two days later. Spends about another month in AAA, then he comes back June 16th, throws a scoreless inning, gets sent back down on June 20th. And then we don't see him for a long, long time. Bauman, after getting sent down June 20th, was not recalled again to the big leagues until September 5th. But when he was recalled that day, When the O's had that doubleheader that day against the Blue Jays, they could call up a 29th guy, so had an extra man to to recall. And I don't think Bauman was technically the extra man. I believe it was Bruce Zimmerman that day, but they did recall him, and he started, you know, one of those games. Got the start in game one. But then he was in the big leagues for the rest of the year. Made six appearances, four starts down the stretch for the Orioles. You know, they, they kind of needed a starter because they had multiple double headers. They had Lyles get sick. They had Spencer Watkins uh, essentially lose everything, go to AAA. Of course, Tyler Wells was, was still injured and weren't sure what they were going to get getting him back. Then they brought him back and he got injured again. So they needed a starter and Bauman filled in. And in 22 and a third innings pitched in September and October, he had a 4.84 ERA. Now opponents hit 326 against him, a 15% strikeout rate, not very good, but only a 3% walk rate, threw a lot of strikes, didn't let a lot of free base runners, but he did get hit hard a lot of the times. So you put together that whole season and you end up with, in the big leagues, 13 appearances, four starts. And in 34 and third innings, he had a 4.72 ERA with a 3.87 FIP. So he pitched a little better than the ERA showed. Now, not a lot of strikeouts at all just six Ks per nine to go along with 2.4 walks per nine on the season was generally a ground ball pitcher and did get a little unlucky, a 357 BABIP against him on the year. So you throw it all together and say, well, what does it mean? And, And for Mike Bauman, what it means is I don't understand why he can't strike guys out at the major league level. This happened last year when he first came out. Remember he, he got a taste right at the end of 2021, four outings, 10 innings, and despite good stuff, he only had five strikeouts to go along with six walks in those 10 innings at the end of the year. And while the AAA stuff was good strikeout-wise, he just can't seem to miss bats at the major league level. I don't know exactly what it is, but there's something there where the swing and miss rate for Mike Bauman is just not what you want it to be. It's just, it's 6%, 6% swinging strike rate this year. It's not good. And when guys are swinging it at just under 50% of his pitches, they swing at 49.3% of the pitches he threw this year. I mean, they're making contact with 92% of the pitches that he threw in the strike zone that they swung at. He's not missing a lot of bats. I mean, 87% contact in general. He's not missing bats. And he's got good stuff. I mean, you look at the fastball, it's at 96. He rides it up in the zone. But, I mean, opponents hit 375 and slugged 516 against the fastball this year. Then he's got that slider. I mean, that's his pitch. 
And that's the one where he does miss some bats. It's a 92 mile per hour, basically long cutter. It's an intense pitch. Guys in only 220 against it, 23% whiff rate. And he's got the curveball and he's got the change up that'll throw in from time to time. But he's just not getting the swings and misses. And as I said, he got him in AAA, which is great. His AAA season, 20 appearances, nine starts. In 60 innings, he had a 4.20 ERA, 12.2 Ks per nine, 3.7 walks per nine in AAA for Mike Bauman. So he's getting the swings and misses there. You know, he's he's at more of a, a 13% swinging strike rate in AAA this year. That's much, much better than the 6% in the big leagues. But you can't just be a 4A guy if you're Mike Bauman. I mean, a former top 10 prospect in the Orioles system and a guy who, if he doesn't get injured, you know, between 2020 and, and 2021, I think gets to the big leagues much, much earlier than he did, which was right at the end of the 21 season. Former third round pick of the O's in 2017. I mean, you never know how the Elias regime feels about him because he was a, a Dan Duquette draft pick in 2017. And he's already 27 years old, but he's still on some, or at least he was before this year, on some prospect lists as well. And he's got good stuff. I mean, I love that slider. I think he can play. He can work through a lineup. He's just got to miss some more bats. I mean, it's that simple. And it might be about revamping the fastball because guys are all over that fastball. I like the slider. I think if you focus on one of the big curveball or the change up, he can really hone it in. But he's got to work on that fastball. Change the shape, change something about it, maybe turn it into a sinker, into a cutter. I'm not quite sure, but it doesn't miss any bats. And it's got to miss bats because as I just talked about with Keegan Aiken, it's going to be tough for Bauman to find a spot on this team. Even if the O's just sign one pitcher, I think Aiken's probably above Bauman right now on chances to make this team as kind of that swingman reliever role. Getting a starting role on this team, I mean, between Grayson and Tyler Wells and Austin Voth and Kyle Bradish and Dean Kramer and D.L. Hall and any free agent they bring in and whoever it may be, Mike Bauman's way behind all those guys. So I think if he's going to be on this team next year, it's going to be in a relief role, whether it's one or two innings, whether they just say, here's one inning, let it rip. You know, maybe the fastball plays up to 99, like we've seen it before. And that slider is devastating. He's just a two pitch pitcher. I think he can do that. And I think he can be successful like that, but he has to revamp the fastball a little bit and he's got to change something this off season to get on this team. Because if the O's were still in full rebuild and basically tanking, he'd get a lot of innings as long as he was healthy next year. That's not the case. They're trying to win. And if he's not missing bats at the major league level, all he's going to be is a depth piece who sits in AAA, you know, gets called up from time to time when there's injuries, maybe comes up for a spot start, but never locks down a consistent major league role. Because if you can't miss bats in the majors in 2022 and 2023, you're not going to have a consistent big league role. He can get away with what he has to be an option for the Orioles and the bigs, but he's not going to be an everyday kind of option unless he makes a change. And I believe he can. I believe he got the stuff to do it. We're going to have to see it happen this offseason for Mike Bauman. But as I mentioned, the Orioles, of course, I think they're going to bring in some pitching. Hopefully the move starts soon. We'll have it all covered here on the pod. But a couple other moves around baseball were made over the past couple of days. And coming up next to finish off the pod, just wanted to get to them, talk about how they relate to the Orioles before we get you out of here on a Wednesday episode. But first, this Wednesday episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by BetOnline.net, which is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis this fall. Because we've got the NFL, we got college football, conference championship weekend coming up on Saturday, college basketball on every single night. You got the NBA and the NHL and the World Cup, the U.S. A huge one 0 victory over Iran on Tuesday, moving into the knockout stage round of sixteen on Saturday against the Netherlands. Get all the lines and the odds on every World Cup match at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, I hope you do if you're listening to this one, you can find those at BetOnline as well. They're the always, always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. That's BetOnline, where the game starts. So to finish out today's episode, just wanted to get a little update on some moves that have been made around baseball over the past couple of days, just because the Orioles have not been active yet. Of course, the winter meetings do start on Sunday, so hopefully that means some moves start to come down for the Orioles. But we saw Jose Abreu, he's been the big one so far, sign a three-year deal with the Houston Astros. They're kind of moving on from both Yuli Gurriel and Trey Mancini at first base and filling in with Jose Abreu, who had a great, great year in Chicago. Not sure why they didn't bring him back, but Houston just adds another piece to a championship team. And a brand new guy I thought, you know, maybe the O's would look at to be in kind of a first base DH swap with Ryan Mountcastle, be in a similar role 
you know, that Trey Mancini was in last year, except for the fact that obviously Abreu wouldn't play the outfield at all, but would have been a good veteran right-handed hitter to add to this lineup who still has production, still has pop. But the Astros, I think, paid a little bit more than other teams were willing to pay, and, and that's why they got him. And then, and then there's the moves on Tuesday, not big-time moves, but just moves that were interesting to me. Jammer Candelario, who was non-tendered by the Tigers, third baseman, who had pretty good 2020 and 21, but was a disaster in 2022. He signs a major league deal for one year with the Nationals. Kind of the perfect fit right there. I mean, Candelario is a guy who just needs consistent at-bats on a bad team to try and revamp his image. The Nats are the perfect team for that. He'll play every day at third base there. And then Shelby Miller signing a major league contract with the Dodgers. Always opens your eyes. He is the next of a long line of Dodgers pitching reclamation prospect. Or of course, Shelby Miller was once an ace at times in this league. And, you know, that was pitching for the D-backs and the Braves and had all the injuries and then has been in the minors for the last couple of years and pitched a little bit with the Pirates and the majors last year. But the fact that the Dodgers signed him to a major league deal tells me that Shelby Miller is probably back. They probably see something in his stuff that they can fix. And he will start 18 games and have a 275 ERA for the Dodgers next year. And then next offseason, he will get a three year, $40 million deal as a starting pitcher in the big leagues because that's what the Dodgers do. And Miller still has talent, and the Dodgers will uh, certainly get it out of there. But hey, hopefully, coming up on tomorrow's episode, we'll be back here for a Thursday pod. Hopefully, we can talk about an Orioles move that they made. But again, if you didn't hear it early in the podcast, make sure to either on this episode or yesterday's episode, Subscribe to the Locked on Orioles podcast on YouTube and leave a comment in the YouTube comments on today or Tuesday's episode. Either your favorite memory of Eddie Murray playing for the Orioles or just your favorite stat or fact about Eddie Murray with the O's. If, like me, you were too young to see him play in an Oreo uniform. If you do that, you will be entered to win one of the beautiful, beautiful Steady Eddie prints done by the Pop Fly Pop Shop. We had the artist... Daniel Horan on the podcast yesterday to talk about his fantastic artwork, how it started in 2020 and what led him to do the piece on Eddie Murray. And again, you can win a free one right here by just commenting anything you love about Eddie Murray in the YouTube comments and subscribing to the Locked on Orioles podcast. And again, make sure to keep an eye on your comment because by Friday, I'm going to pick a winner and I will reply to your comment if you do win with more instructions to get that free print. Again, you can only get them this week, so make sure to get those comments in on the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. But I'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the pod talking all things Orioles as the offseason rolls on. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked on Orioles podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.